Welcome to the Fall 2020 Ladies Big Book Study Recording Series. My name is Kimberly and I am a recovered alcoholic. I am the facilitator of a tri-weekly big book study for ladies only and we record each session so we can share the knowledge along with you. What we do is we read the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous line by line. We pause on each page and have discussion time to share our experience, our strength, and our hope on each page. You are more than welcome to follow along in this series and do the work of the steps of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you do need support at any time, please reach out to me in the Contact Us area of my YouTube channel and we're happy to provide you with support. The online recordings are open to men and women. Do not be discouraged, gentlemen. Our ladies' point of view may offer you a different perspective. So welcome. I hope you enjoy. All right, ladies, we are continuing on in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are on the page 94, top of the page. Outline the program of action explaining how you made a self-appraisal, how you straightened out your past, and why you are now endeavoring to be helpful to him. It is important for him to realize that your attempt to pass this on to him plays a vital part in your own recovery. Actually, he may be helping you more than you are helping him. Make it plain that he is under no obligation to you, that you only hope that he will try to help other alcoholics when he escapes his own difficulties. Suggest how important it is that he place the welfare of other people ahead of his own. Make it clear that he is not under pressure, that he needn't see you again if he doesn't want to. You should not be offended if he wants to call it off, for he has helped you more than you have helped him. If your talk has been sane, quiet, and full of human understanding, you have perhaps made a friend. Maybe you have disturbed him about the question of alcoholism. This is all to the good. The more hopeless he feels, the better. He will be more likely to follow your suggestions. Your candidate may give reasons why he need not follow all of the program. He may rebel at the thought of a drastic house cleaning which requires discussion with other people. Do not contradict such views. Tell him you once felt as he does, but you doubt whether you would have made such progress had you not taken action. On your first visit, tell him about the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. If he shows interest, lend him your copy of this book. Uh, I have that written underneath her. Do not give him your book. Keep your book. Have some spares. <laughs> um, don't give away your book. You need your book. Uh, but yes, yeah, so in here, it's there's a few notable things on this page. Uh, one is twice we talk about the self-appraisal and the personal house cleaning. Um, so there, that is of importance. And number one is because most people, that's their strongest objection. They don't want to do step four. Um, but here it talks about it twice, first in the first paragraph and once in the second paragraph, because that's a vital step in our program of recovery. Um, I don't dwell myself personally on how much this is helping me as it is helping them. What I do like to say is that I've found freedom from doing this program and I love sharing it with other people. Um, otherwise, it doesn't really hit the same way. You know, you're helping me stay sober by letting me talk to you. It doesn't really have the same effect. My, my favorite go-to is that, you know what, I have found such freedom and my life is so freaking amazing. I absolutely want you to have the same thing. Um, sometimes if I have someone that keeps relapsing over and over and over again, I just wish I had these glasses that I could give them to show them a glimpse of me, right? If you could be in my brain for two minutes, you would want what I have. So somehow we have to transmit that to them. Um, I have a funny story about one of my sponsees. There was a girl and um, we had all tried to help her in our group. So I had tried to help her with a couple other girls and she just could, kept relapsing. She wasn't ready yet. That's okay. Um, and then another girl was like, I'll go try. And so she drove all the way out to see her in White Rock, which is about an hour's drive. And she sat outside this girl's house for 45 minutes and she called me in a tizzy. She was tick. She's like, this girl stood me up. She's not answering her phone now. I drove all the way here. And I'm like, mm-hmm. And I go, 
was it a nice drive? And she's, huh? I go, was it a nice drive? She goes, yeah, I stopped and got fish and chips on the way. I said, wow, at Coney Island? Those are amazing. You know, it's such a great place. Everybody talks about it. She goes, yeah. I go, did you pick up a drink? She says, no. I said, so you stayed sober and you had a lovely drive and fish and chips. And she goes, yeah. I'm like, so you did your job. We do this to keep sober. We're not trying to save the world. Um, we are, but we're not. We're not evangelists. We're not reformers. What we are is we're alcoholics who have a message to carry. And by carrying it, we stay sober. What they do with that message is up to them. I can't control it. Um, I can't stop someone from drinking. Only God can do that. What I can do is I can offer them the solution that worked for me. So um, really important to remember that. Another story is I heard I had a sponsee die two days before Christmas last year. And I found out at five, a day, five in the morning. And um, I shared it at a meeting because it was on the top of my heart. And I also shared how I immediately got back into service and was helping my other sponsees. And I took to heart what Bill says. Sometimes they just don't see our way of life. And that's okay. But what it did do is it fired me up a little more. It made me a little more willing and open-minded to be a little louder in my recovery. So as a result of Lillian dying, here we all sit one year later. She couldn't get willing. And that's on her. So another woman at that meeting that day, she goes, I had a sponsee die 12 years ago. And I haven't helped anyone since. I said, that sucks. How's your sobriety? Shitty. Like, you need to start helping people. It is not our responsibility to keep people sober. It is not our responsibility to get people sober. It is our responsibility to hold out the hand of AA when and if someone asks for our help. And I make sure that hand is right here shaking that people know it's here. Because a lot of people don't know that hand is there right now. Or they're too scared to reach out. So make that hand available. Here's my hand. I am here to help. Grab it. That's how I live my life. That's how I live my sobriety. Your candidate may give reasons why he need not follow all of the program. Oh, I got to keep my job. Oh, my boyfriend. Oh, my kids. I had a girl. She's like, I can't come to BC to go to treatment because I got kids. Within 30 days, she was out here for a guy. I lost my shit. I was like, you came out here for a guy you met on the internet, but you can't come out here for treatment for your kids because of your kids. Like, you're going to hear every excuse under the sun, and it's all garbage. You're going to have to weed through that. And you get really good at giving little one-liner back. Um, but it's, it's not our job to contradict them. Our job is to share our experience. I've seen people say that before. I've heard people say that before. This is what happened. They call me from the psych ward each and every time. Um, so don't be afraid to say things. Don't be afraid to disturb people. People do not grow in their comfort zone. People do not grow when you're like, it's going to be okay. This book tells me to get them hopeless. Do not say it's going to be okay. Say, it's not going to be okay. It's going to get worse. It's going to suck. And they're going to be like, huh? Tell them the fucking truth. Don't lie to them and say, it's going to be okay. It's all going to work out. It's not. You're going to keep drinking. Your problems are going to keep piling up and you're going to die. Hopeless. We want them to be hopeless. And then we're going to tell them about the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Lead with the fellowship. I am part of a group of people who like to help people get sober. We band together to support each other in this journey. We are here to help you. We, 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 we. I try not to use I. We're here to help. One I love to say is, I got you and God's got me. Let's go. Because they don't have God yet. So that's my favorite one-liner. I got you and God's got me. And we go from there. But yeah, don't give them their book. Give them a book, but don't give them your book. Okay, anybody want to enhance on that page, please, and thank you? Anne-Marie, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I was calling to ask you where the heck you were, because I can't find 
thing about I have to have a job first or I have to have a... No, no, I'm I just have, saying those are the excuses they give. That that Your oh, candidate uh, may give reasons why he need not follow all of the program or they may give reasons why they can't start now. Okay, I'll well, start I, in two weeks. I have to get my stuff in storage first. But, but I still don't know where you are. 95? 94. 94. But bottom, your candidate may give you reasons why he oh. need not follow. Okay. Found it. Got I'll it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard that one last last month. I, I got I gotta move my stuff into storage. I can't go to treatment till I get my stuff safe. She's still out on the streets. God knows where her stuff is. I would have put her stuff in storage while she was in treatment. That's that's who I am. Uh, phone caller one two six last three digits. Hi, I'm Suzanne, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, I um, it says the more hopeless he feels, the better. Uh, but uh, I just recently had to let a sponsee go. Um, she was in and out of the program, and uh, she just uh, was unwilling to take suggestions. And um, it got to the point where I said to her, I said, I don't know, uh, I don't know what more I can do for you. I said, um, it's not working, and uh, she had been avoiding the fourth step because I had asked her, I said, have you ever, in the years that you've been in and out, have you ever done a fourth step? And she said no. And she kind of uh, shied away from the fourth step, and then, of course, uh, she drank again. And so um, I had to let her go. And uh, I felt bad about it. But on the other hand, if somebody isn't ready, we cannot uh, get them sober. And uh, so I just have to move on. I have a couple sponsors. Of course, you know, they've been in the program for years. And uh, they do work the program. And I work the program. So uh, I just wanted to share that with you. And thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you so much. And it's absolutely okay to lovingly release someone and wait until they're willing. Call me when you're ready to stop. It's okay. It's okay to hold the space for someone. Love, it's better than trying to push them into something they don't want and having them not willing to come back to you. Be like, it's okay. I'm here when you're ready. That girl that wanted to put her stuff in storage, I send her and I love you. It's in hearts all the time. I'm here when you're ready. I'm here when you're ready. And you know what she says back? You're the only person who hasn't given up on me. And I say back, I won't. I'm here when you're ready. Marianne, Toronto. Hi, friends. I am an alcoholic from Toronto. My name is Marianne. Grateful to be here. Grateful to be sober. This I find, this is a tough, this is tough for me. And I, I know I bring it up every time we go over it because I guess I'm coming from a place of experience where I was pretty desperate and I, I needed somebody to cut the, through the shit and the excuses and that. So I tend to do that with people I'm trying to help. And this is my worry because I don't want to give up on them and I want to lovingly hold that space. But I deal with people that, you know, just fool with this so much and, and, uh, I just can't, it, it just wells up inside of me saying you will die if you don't put down that substance and start doing this. And so I really struggle. So I'm so glad that we go over this because, um, I, I, uh, I get too much in my head and then I guess I figure I'm going to get somebody well or fix them. And I know I can't. But it, it's, it's a struggle because I, I was pretty desperate. I had to get busy doing this. I couldn't talk about it anymore, especially relapsers. I have a couple of people that have been in and out for years. And it's like, what are you waiting for? You know, like, you're suffering. Let's do this together, you know. Anyway, just wanted to share. I Thank you for being here. Thank you. You got to remember, you can't kill them. They're already killing themselves. People are like, oh, I'm scared I'm going to gonna hurt them. They're already killing themselves. Nothing you can say is going to kill them. If you're lovingly trying, and it's it's every situation is different. We know who our prospects are. 
We know them because we've been involved with them for a long time, a lot of times. And if they're constant relapsers, yeah, I'm going to call them on their shit. And they're going to, they can hate me all they want. I will disturb people, gladly push them towards somebody else just to get them sober. Um, my girlfriend, Jill, and I, we have a sponsorship arrangement where she'll push people and then make them come to me. I'll give her. Same as if we go on vacation, when we're allowed to go on vacation, she'll say, hey, Kim, I'm going to Hawaii. Can you take my sponsees? I have a sponsorship arrangement with another girlfriend so that we tag team. So we, it's a community here. We need to support one another. And I'll push someone and I'll say, this girl's just not getting it with me. I'm going to disturb her and you're going to pick her up. We do it both back and forth. And it's you get this little song and dance where you know what this person, you know their, their little intricacies that you need to like push that button. Push that button. Because look, there's 45 other people in this room that can help that girl. So if I can push that button enough to disturb her enough that she's like, I'm going to fucking get sober. I'm going to show you. Perfect. Call Margaret. Call Marianne. I got a girl. Call this person. Just call somebody. Doesn't have to be me. Joanne. Hi, I'm Joanna. I'm an alcoholic addict. And this is, I prayed for this meeting. You have no idea. <laughs> I, uh. I did some, you know, I heard an old timer say, be willing to do everything you don't want to. And I finally, you know, I was starting to feel like, oh, God, do I have to go to Al-Anon for my sponsees? You know, because I was looking at what I was doing, how I was interacting, what my fears were. Well, what if they go out? What if this? What if that? And suddenly I realized that I was entering more into their insane lives than they were entering in my serene, sober life. And finally, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I, I kind of lost it. And I have a sponsee who... Uh, we've been doing this fourth step, and every time she calls me, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And and I said, when was the last time you were at a meeting? Oh, like a week and a half, two weeks. And I was like, do not call me until you've gone to a meeting. And she was like, what? I said, do not call me until you've gone to a meeting. Because she wants to talk about her unmanageable life. And so I, I, I got off the phone, and I was like, Lois might be proud of me. Or I might need to make it amends. I don't know on this one. And then a, a day later, she calls me back and she says, are you really not going to talk to me if I don't go to a meeting? And I said, that's right. I'm not going to talk to you because I can't be your fellowship. I go to meetings. I ask for help. I have a fellowship that helps me not drink. And I can't be the only one in your fellowship. And I'm also tired of the whining. I just really go to a meeting and then you can call me and she hasn't called me and I'm okay with that. Yeah. I'm, I'm really, really okay with that. Um, it would felt a little bit harsh, but you know what? What's harsh is not working the program. Life will teach her what she is going to find out if she is a true alcoholic and doesn't get the help she needs. Life will teach her. I don't have to teach her. But, man, I have to protect my sanity. You know? And I can, I have heard before that sometimes my compassion can help an alcoholic bottom up, you know, go back out. And sometimes I just need to be firm in my belief of you don't drink you go to meetings where you learn about the steps and how to work the program and all of that and you ask for help but I am not a therapist I am not a lawyer I am not a marriage counselor um and I am not your whining bag so um it felt bad because that's not me that's why I said I qualify for Al-Anon <laughs> but if I want to get better, I have to start doing things that make me feel a little bit uncomfortable and, uh, and trust that it will be okay because my phone is always there for her. I just need to control my sobriety and my serenity again. And with that, I'll share the time. Thank you so much, Joanne. And yeah, we have to remember 
we're not qualified for a lot of things. Um, we are not, I am only qualified to transmit this program. That's it. Maybe some accounting advice, maybe some parenting experience. I ain't qualified for anything else. It's way above my pay grade and I don't get paid here. So, you know, um, let the professionals deal with the professionally things. Um, let marriage counselors deal with marriage counselor things. I can only apply this. This is all I know. And I made that mistake early in my sponsorship sobriety, right? I would try to give advice. And now I'm, no, I'm like, I'm not qualified. I can tell you my experience and how I use this through mine. But my, my childhood trauma, I went and saw an NLP practitioner and did hypnotherapy. I'm not qualified to tell you how to overcome trauma. I'm not. My marriage, it didn't go off so well. And, you know, it was only through AA and um, Al-Anon that I was able to become a more compassionate ex-wife. So we have to be humble enough to say, I'm not qualified and I'm not your dumping ground. Um, and, you know, I don't care what people think about me. That, that, that's a big thing. We can't be scared to hurt people's feelings around here. They're going to die. We have to remember that. Anne-Marie. Hi. Um, yeah, I just want to add that I've had occasion a couple of times uh, to um, – uh, let go of uh, sponsees. I hate the term fire. You know, it's all you fire your sponsee or you fired your sponsor. Uh, no. But anyway, I had to let them go. And because the fit wasn't there. Sometimes it's just a question of fit either, you know. And I've always thought to myself, if, if I'm tying them to me, I'm not giving them the opportunity to find the right sponsor. Because I'm obviously not it. So it's, a, it, it's, it's, for me, it's more a question of, I'm not helping you, I'm hindering you. Yeah. So go find someone else. I wish I could recommend others, but we don't have that kind of tight community here. We're not quite that. But I'm going to see if I can build it up. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. And, and you know what? That's probably like one of my secret little weapons that I have in my sobriety superpower is I attended so many meetings and I just paid attention to who and what and when and where and what they were sharing that I have this little library of people. And I'll be like, you know what? And I had a guy, it was so funny, he was going through a really shitty breakup. And what do we know works best when we're in low times? Working with others. So I saw a guy on a Facebook page who was new and struggling and I said, you need to work with him. And he goes, I'm not in a place to work with anybody. I said, well, you're not in a place to offer relationship advice, but you can help a newcomer get sober. And he went, oh, right? So it's like we might not have much to offer in other areas when we're having struggles, but all we need to do is step one. My life's unmanageable and I need to get sober. And, you know, from there, they both ended up working together and feeling better. So um, just remember, working with others is what gives us immunity. Page 95. Unless your friend wants to talk further about himself, do not wear out your welcome. Give him a chance to think it over. If you do stay, let him steer the conversation in any direction he likes. Sometimes a new man is anxious to proceed at once. You may be tempted to let him do so. This is sometimes a mistake. If he has trouble later, he is likely to say you rushed him. You will be most successful with alcoholics if you do not exhibit any passion for crusade or reform. Never talk down to an alcoholic from any moral or spiritual hilltop. Simply lay out the kit of spiritual tools for his inspection. Show him how they worked with you. Offer him friendship and fellowship. Tell him that if he wants to get well, you will do anything to help. If he is not interested in your solution, if he expects you to only act as a banker for his financial difficulties or a nurse for his sprees, you may have to drop him until he changes his mind. This he may, after, he may do after he gets hurt some more. If he doesn't want what we have, let him get hopeless enough till he wants it. There is a million more behind him in line. 
There is a shit ton of suffering alcoholics right now. It doesn't work on one, go to the next. Keep going. I call it trolling for sponsees. I'm a pickup artist. I love finding sick people and trying to like throw them in a big book study or throw them on a meeting. I'm not hoarding. I'm not a hoarder. But I love trolling for newcomers. I love it. Um, in that first paragraph, uh, do not wear out your welcome. I typically don't wear out my welcome. They usually wear out theirs because <laughs> they, they start talking about all their problems and I just can't handle it. Uh, but here, we don't want to be on a crusade. You know, we want to give them enough information that they want what we have and see where we go from there. It's it's an art form. You, you have to find a comfort level with it. Every situation is not the same. Um, but if you're there preaching, probably time to go. Like, drop the information, let them marinate on it, and say, I'll check on you in the morning. And then usually they may have messaged you before you check on them, saying, hey, I, I was thinking about what you said yesterday, and I'd like to do the steps. Um, you know, it, it's it's a gauge. Get You just got to read the conversation. Uh, but if they're not having it, go home. Don't, don't try to save, crusade, persuade. It doesn't work. Um, and, you know, we are not a nurse for sprees or a dumping ground for problems. And it's okay to move on. Oh, I'm never going to find another sponsee. Yeah, you will. Come on a meeting. Get your butt out of your house. Get on a Zoom. There's lots of struggling people right now. Lots. Hop in a Facebook group. Like I'm telling you right now, if you want a sponsee, this is the week to get them. People are struggling. It's Christmas. They want support. Put your hand out and people are gonna grab it. They will. Trust me. Because my hand's the only one out half the time and I'm like, do you want to share the wealth here? Put your hand out. There's tons of people struggling right now. Don't preach. Don't crusade. Offer that gentle hand of AA and they will grab it. There's enough crusaders and persuaders. Just hold that loving hand out and you'll catch some fish. If he is seriously interested and wants to see you again, ask him to read this book in the interval. After doing that, he must decide for himself whether he wants to go on. He should not be pushed or prodded by you, his wife, or his friends. If he is to find God, the desire must come from within. Um, so read this book in the interval. That's where I like to highlight those, those uh, stories at the beginning about the women. And I'll have them start by reading those stories and looking for those three things um, that are at the bottom of the preface. Um, for those who don't remember... Um, the preface at the bottom has instructions on the stories. It says, read one of these 42 personal stories and think, yes, this happened to me. Yes, I felt like that. Yes, I believe this program can work for me too. If you have a prospect that isn't sure, have them read some stories and look for those three things. They should, if they're alcoholic, come back to you and say, oh my God, I saw myself in those stories. That is me. Bingo, let's get started. We have a solution. Ding, 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 ding. Um, that's, that's the hook. That's the hook. Read these stories. Look for those three, three things. If you see yourself in those pages, give me a call. I got a solution for you. All right. If he thinks he can do the job in some other way or prefers some other spiritual approach, encourage him to follow his own conscience. We have no monopoly on God. We merely have an approach that worked for us, but point out that we alcoholics have much in common and that if you, and if that you would like in any case to be friendly. If they don't want to work with me, I'm still offering my hand. I don't close the door. Yeah, if you want to try that route, go ahead. I had a girl that wanted to try that weird hypno psychotic wackadoodle beach thing, you know. It's like a weird neurotropic thing and supposed to bring you a spiritual experience she came back um I'm like yeah go ahead try all I know is that this worked for me I'm happy to show you what worked for me but check out other things I don't have a monopoly on God I just I want to see you get sober I want to see you happy um if you have any questions ask me 
Leave that door open. Leave that hand extended. You know, so many times I see people go, well, it is the way for 85 years. That This ain't the way. It ain't going to work. It's true. But we don't want to lead with that, right? This is the only thing I've seen work. I'm happy to show you, but gosh, I hope you, I wish you luck. And let me know if you have any questions or if you need any support. I'm happy to be your recovery friend, right? Recovery Canada was founded because there's so many people trying so many different things and AA had this monopoly in our community. Really, it's a big old pool of sick people that we just keep dripping on. And when they're not working, they stick their hand up and go, hey, can I try what you're doing? Because I tried all these other things and it didn't work. Yeah, we just herd them all together. Shh, it's a secret, right? We want to remain helpful. We want to remain that door open. Yeah, absolutely. I, You know what? Whatever works for you. I'm so happy. Let me know how it goes. I'm here to support you. I'm here to be your recovery friend. You know, I, I just want you to be well. When it doesn't work, I'm here. They're still going to come to me. I can still drip on them. They're still watching my Facebook posts. They're still watching my life get increasingly better and better and better. And they're still spinning in the mud. So eventually that light bulb will go on. They're like, well, I'm two years sober and I'm just not as happy as you. How come you're so successful? Let me show you. Keep the door open. I didn't realize that two years ago. I closed a lot of recovery doors. I made that mistake. This is the way. This is the only way. I'm a little bit wiser now to that. That, that program doesn't work. Keeping the door open and the hand. The responsibility statement when I heard it hit me like a ton of bricks. It hit me like a ton of bricks. All right. Anybody want to add on any of that? Does everybody know the responsibility statement? So it's I am responsible. When, uh, hang on. Anywhere, any, well, when anyone anywhere reaches out for help, I want the hand of AA always to be there. For that, I am responsible. So I heard that at my first um, service uh, assembly and it hit me. I am responsible to have the hand of AA to be there. I need to be open and available. I need to be approachable. I need to be humble. I had to learn that. I wasn't that way before. Marianne. I use that responsibility pledge with people that are not in problems with alcoholism either, but just in up there. This that I have to always use that because I may be a big book to somebody that doesn't even realize they need help. So. That responsibility pledge is good for me everywhere. Absolutely. I can't just be little Miss Sobriety when I'm standing at a podium of Alcoholics Anonymous. I need to be a responsible member of Alcoholics Anonymous in every step I take in life. That is how we attract people to Alcoholics Anonymous. People from my past that knew what kind of a degenerate bitch I was, they see me now and they're like, whoa. That's big. People that know me from before, like, look at me now and they're like, holy fuck, girl, you're not the same girl at all. That's big statement, right? That's the that's the picture your sobriety should say. All right. How are we doing on time? We're doing good. All right. For the type of alcoholic who is able and willing to get well, little charity in the ordinary sense of the word is needed or wanted. The men who cry for money and shelter before conquering alcohol are on the wrong track. I'll read it again. Those who cry for money and shelter before conquering alcohol are on the wrong track. Well, I just need to get my employer okay. I just need to get this new condo. I just need to get a car. I just, I just, I just, I just am not going to get sober. Yet we do do go to great extremes to provide each other with these very things when such action is warranted. This may seem inconsistent, but we think it is not. I will help someone um, get a step up. I will help them find resources. Will I let someone stay in my house on my couch? No. For a night? Maybe. But on average? No. I will help you find a shelter. I will help you access a welfare office. I will help put you in touch with resources. Will I cradle you? No. 
Okay, question privately in the chat is, what if my life doesn't look that attractive? I live in a modest apartment and I drive an old car. My current car twerks at red lights. My son just laughed. Um, we're not talking attractive in monetary things. We're talking attractive in personality, in stature, in vibrancy, in kindness, in love, in tolerance. Monetary things are not what makes us attractive. That's ego. People can see me drive up in my shitty little modest car. I drive a Mercedes up until a year ago when I crashed it. I drive a little beater that literally twerks at red lights and has scratches. And I love it. It's my humble mobile. And people get up to my car. They're like, oh my God, I love your car. And I'm like, this piece of shit? They're like, yeah. Maybe it's my glow. It makes it look better. I don't know. People seem to love my beater car, right? My, my recovery just looks attractive because of the way I carry myself, because of the way I treat people, because of the way I aim to be helpful. That's what makes our sobriety attractive. A guy driving a, a $80,000 truck who has big attitude and ego, he isn't attracting a lot of people. He's got, the, he's got the wrong kind of attraction where like the newcomer guy that was a thug that's like, yeah, I want a nice truck too. I better stay sober. When you have real sobriety, you don't need those material things. People just are like, ooh, there's something about that girl. There's something about that guy. I want what they have. All right. So yeah, so a little bit of charity is okay. I do not lend money. I do not let people in my house. But I sure as heck will buy someone dinner. I sure as heck will, you know, facilitate someone um, getting into a, a shelter or um, getting access to resources. The only person I ever let stay in my house was I let the person, I stole this big book who I was in a relationship for two years, stay in my house over a weekend to shower and he went to detox the next day. Actually, I didn't even let him sleep here. I let him come for dinner, have a shower. He went and slept at a crack house and he came back the next day and we drove him to treatment. So I, I lied. I did not let him sleep here that night. Um, it is not the matter of giving that is the question, but it is when and how to give. That often makes the difference between failure and success. The minute we put our work on a service plane, the alcoholic commences to rely upon our assistance rather than upon God. Highlighted, underlined, and starred. We are not a higher power. I cannot be the first call you make to keep you sober. I cannot be the be-all, end-all in your recovery. God comes first. I know so many people that their sponsor is their lifeline. Their decision-making, their lifeline. God is my higher power. God is my lifeline. God is who saved my ass the day I was driving to get a bottle of wine. God needs to be the first call you make. He may not answer right away, but he's the first call you need to break. I actually know a guy, and if his sponsees call him in a tizzy, he's like, did you pray? And he hangs up. Seems a little harsh, but God needs to be first. If you're, if you're in the liquor store hugging three bottles of wine, calling your sponsor, you're fucked, right? Your sponsor might be busy that day. You know, we can't rely on human power, so, um, but we can offer guidance and support. He clamors for this or that, claiming he cannot master ma alcohol until his material needs are cared for. Nonsense. Some of us have taken very hard knocks to learn this truth. Job or no job, wife or no wife, we simply do not stop drinking so long as we place dependence upon other people Ahead of dependence on God. You're going to lose it anyways. Whatever you put before your sobriety is going to be the first to go. Burn the idea into the consciousness of every man that he can get well regardless of anyone. The only condition is that he trust God and clean house. Marianne Toronto. Hi, sorry. Um, yeah, so I was 
talking with my grand sponsor in the summer, and she had me read January 6th, 24-hour-a-day book um, about trying to help someone, and it's nothing. Nothing is more that I can put more important than my sobriety, and, it, and she has me put on the top of it. Do I understand this? January 6th, 24-hour-a-day book. And uh, she keeps telling me that, too, because I've got here, if I want their sobriety more than they do, then I am doomed. Yep, absolutely. So I've told you all my hierarchy, my five. God and recovery comes first. My kids come second. My business and my job comes third. Myself, my friends, and my sober sisters come fourth. And any partner I ever have comes fifth. That's how it goes. And my kids, I've had a conversation with them and they understand mom's sober and we have this life because of God and recovery. Sometimes I have to pick up calls from sponsees. Sometimes I'm doing all of this charity work. Why? Because it affords me Christmas Eve where I have to do nothing and I can spend an amazing sober day. I'm going to post a picture of what Christmas Eve looked like five years ago and it wasn't pretty. I forgot to pick my kids up on Christmas Eve because I was blackout on my floor. And I had to call my ex-husband at 8 in the morning and finish wrapping gifts very quickly because I was blackout drunk. Christmas doesn't look like that anymore. Why? Because I spend hours like this. My kids come second because they're my kids. They need my support. My business comes third because I got to pay my bills. Now I come fourth because I need me. Then whatever's left over, somebody else can have. And that's not going to change. Because you know what it used to look like? A guy booze, my kids, oh, maybe me, but usually friends that I was trying to suck life from, right? And I was miserable. This little pattern, it works really well, really well. I might be busy and frazzled, but it, it affords me the luxury of this amazing sober life I get, where after today, I'm going to have some days where I can just bake cookies and be the normal person. Am I still going to be of service? Damn straight I will. Am I still going to be picking up my phone for sponsees? Damn straight I will. Because that's how I've got this life. That's how I've got the serenity. So it's very, very important. Uh, we are not going to get through this chapter today. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, but let's take a stab and see how far we can get. Um, now the domestic problem. There may be divorce, separation, or just strained relations. When your prospect has made such reparation as he can to his family and has thoroughly explained to them the new principles by which he is living, he should proceed to put these principles into action at home. That is, if he has, if he's lucky enough to have a home. Though his family be at fault in many respects, he should not be concerned about that. He should concentrate on his own spiritual demonstration. Argument and fault-finding are to be avoided like the plague. In many homes, this is a difficult thing to do, but it must be done if any results are to be expected. If persisted in for a few months, the effect on a man's family is sure to be great. The most incompatible people discover they have a basis upon which they can meet. Little by little, the family may see their own defects and admit them. These can then be discussed in an atmosphere of helpfulness and friendliness. After they have seen tangible results, the family will perhaps want to go along. These things will come to pass naturally and in good time, provided, however, the alcoholic continues to demonstrate that he can be sober, considerate, helpful, regardless of what anyone says or does. Of course, we all fall much below this standard many times. But we must try to repair the damage immediately lest we pay the penalty by a spree. Our families are going to expect us to instantly change. You were in treatment for 30 days. You're sober. You should be a saint now. Progress, not perfection. Our families need to like do some work as well. Unfortunately, we can't say that to them. We can gently encourage them to go to Al-Anon so they can understand but really, we need to walk the walk, talk the talk, and act, consider it helpful, and not reactive. That's the key. If you're living on a different basis, your family will see it and go along. But if your family isn't believing you because it's only been 30 days and you've got 20 years of bullshit, 
We can't react when they come at us. We can't react when they throw stuff in our face from our past. We have to pause. We have to pray. We have to call our support and be like, my wife just doesn't get it. My husband just doesn't get it. My mom is on my case. And your fellow alcoholics are going to say, I know, it takes time. Just keep doing do. Keep putting the next right foot in front of the next right foot. Keep not reacting because your actions and your behavior is the only thing that's going to change their opinion. I can tell them, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. We have to show them. And how we show them is by walking the walk and talking the talk. Marianne? Uh, I just have to put a plug in for a very dear friend of mine who uh, who helped me through this very tough time when people wanted me better right away. A, I had to get that self-restraint um, quality going very good. And then she said, Marianne, just call me. Vent, vent on us. Vent on us. Not your kids. Not your, hus- your husband. No. But just phone and vent on us. And I did. And it really helped. It really helped. And plus the fact that she was, they're the ones who understand. My sober, my normies, quote normies, don't. So that um, that, that was real important. But I, I had to get that self-restraint thing going real quick. Thanks. Thank you. I'm just... Popping this in the chat. We didn't talk long enough. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, and then I spelled it wrong. There we go. All right. If there be divorce or separation, there should be no undue haste for the couple to get together. The man should be sure of his recovery. The wife should fully understand his new way of life. If their old relationship is to be resumed, it must be on a better basis, since the former did not work. This means a new attitude and spirit all around. Sometimes it is to the best interest of all concerned that a couple may remain apart. Obviously, no rule can be laid down. Let the alcoholic continue his program day by day. When the time for living together has come, it will be apparent to both parties. Let no alcoholic say he cannot recover unless he has his family back. This just isn't so. In some cases, the wife may never come back for one reason or another. Remind the prospect that his recovery is not dependent upon people. It is dependent upon his relationship with God. We have seen men get well whose families have not returned at all. We have seen others slip when the families came back too soon. Again, there is no rule here. There is no right or wrong answer. All we have is the experience, strength, and hope of those who have come before us and the reliance upon God. So many people are like, I just got to get my family back. I just got to get it right. You got to get right with God. You got to clean house. You got to work this program. Everything else that's meant to be is meant to be. There's no rule here. Um... None at all. But it's not going to go back to the way it was before because the way it was before wasn't working. Um, The way you were before your alcoholism took hold is not who you are now. In order to successfully do this program, you're going to change. You're going to grow. You're going to find out parts of yourself that you didn't know were there for however long you've been on this earth. If you do this successfully, you're not going to be the same person you ever were. You're going to be a bigger, better, sober, amazing person. And that's okay. It's okay if what you chose 10 years ago isn't what you would choose now. It's okay to change. Get right with God. Find out who you really are. And live your biggest, blessed, sober life. The worst disservice you can do yourself is try to become a square peg in a round hole in recovery. It's not going to work. Become you. Become the vision of what God has for you. And everything else will work out the way it's supposed to work out. 
It doesn't have to look like society tells you it's supposed to look like. There is no rule in life. If you want to leave your husband and move in with a woman, do it. I've got a friend who's done that in sobriety. If you want to be a single, successful, sober woman, rocking it on your own, do it. I'm doing it. It's okay. You do not need to have a man and a woman in a white picket fence with two kids in the backyard and a dog on the porch to be living your best life. Live life for you in God's vision and everything else will fall into place. Find happiness and live it. You don't have to explain it to anybody as long as it's right by God. And God wants you to be happy. That's his only rule. He will love you no matter what as long as you're living in his vision. And that's really important for me to say that to you folks. Because so many people want to be a square in a round peg and it doesn't fucking work. Society doesn't matter. People's opinion of me doesn't matter. People's opinion of you doesn't matter. God's opinion of me is the only one that matters. And he wants me to be loved and happy. And he's going to love me no matter what I do. No matter who I choose. No matter what path I take. As long as I'm doing his do. That's, that's my biggest takeaway. And as a result, I'm happier than a fucking pig and shit. My life has never been happy, better I don't give a fuck what people think about me because God loves me. Guess what? That big empty hole that I used to try to fill is gone. Gone. And it's replaced with a big Care Bear rainbow of fucking love for other people. And it's amazing. Um, so with that, I'm going to end today um, because let's have a little bit of holiday love. So we will finish this next Monday. Which is the, I don't even know, the 28th of December. So let 